Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Gaboyan, and I'm a member of the board of directors of Fred Faribor's Fred Matloub Unit of Bene Bred, the sponsor of today's event. On behalf of all our board members and myself, I would like to thank you all for joining us for what promises to be a timely and informative event. Before I hand this over to Mrs. Sabrina Hakim, who will be managing the event, I would like to let you know that this event is being recorded. And now, without further ado, here's Mrs. Sabrina Hakim. Benebrit International is a humanitarian nonprofit organization established in 1843 to promote peace and tolerance through education and communication and to combat racial and religious prejudice and discrimination. Faribor's Fred Matloub Foundation and its sister organization, Faribor's Fred Matloub Unit of Bene Brit, together the foundation, were established in 1986 by Saeed and Afsar Matloub in memory of their son, Faribor's Fred Matloub. The foundation is a humanitarian, non-religious, non-political, not-for-profit organization with the mission to preserve and promote Persian social and cultural values among the Iranian population of Los Angeles by creating and supporting various educational, cultural, and entertainment programs. Since our board members are all volunteers, 100% of the net proceeds from our fundraising events are distributed to organizations that support children with physical, mental, or financial needs and their families, regardless of race, religion, or ethnicity in the United States and several other countries. Our program today consists of two segments and is a total of about one hour. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for both segments, Elham Yagubian, who is a writer as well as a political and human rights activist and serves on the board of the foundation. Thank you, Sabrina. Hi, everyone. And thank you for taking your time to joining us today. Anti-Semitism is a disease with thousands of faces. It is just one of the manifestations of discrimination, along with sexism, religious fanaticism, apartheid, racism, fascism, and many other forms of hate and discriminations, which prioritize a minority against the majority and vice versa. The lesson one might get from this philosophy is, if you won't fight, fight anti-Semitism, we might also be indifferent and give chance to various other types of discriminatory ideologies facing our new world to be nourished. As Walter Benjamin, the German Jewish philosopher, brilliantly said, if you will not learn from the history, the history will repeat itself. As the chronicle of our words showed, with no need to go too, too far back in the history, this evaluation was correct. The genocide of Armenians, 1950, the Nazism and fascism in World War II, the genocide of Bosnians, the genocide of civilians in Rwanda, massacre of Yazidis, and I can go on and on. Maybe this is a time to learn from the history, not to let it happen again. Hence, Shaw can and should be reconsidered as one of the archetypes of genocide. Without further ado, I would love to start our uh, first panel, The Man Behind the Scene, an untold story of Abdul Hussein Sardari, an Iranian diplomat who saved countless lives during World War II by introducing our guests. Mahdiya Zarezardini, she's an independent filmmaker, writer, and director. She received her master's degree from the Royal Holloway University of London. We are also speaking with Elian Senei Kohanim, a Holocaust survivor saved by Sardari with her family. And Kaveh Sardari, artist and the second nephew of Abdul Hussein Sardari. Before having a conversation with our guest, I would love to invite you to watch a short clip of Sardari's Enigma directed and produced by Mahdi Azarizadini. Farar and Jango, I'm sure you're going to be a good one. 
سینم دارم میدونم ولی معلوم نیست کجا دارم میدونم بعد با یه ناراحتی بیدار میشم خوشبختانه من میگم چقدر خوب خواب بود فقط جو نیکزیسترای پا اوجوری سه کلیر که سان سرداری ایل سووی توت ما فامی پاندان لگر جو سرای توجور رکنیسان سرداری به مرادی میگه که اسامی افراد رو بهش بدید I convened a meeting of all Iranians living in the occupied zone. My father got Sardari to write papers for all these people that says that we are not Jewish. ایشون در پاریس روابط خیلی خوبی با رؤسای ارتش آلمان در فرانسه داشتن سرداری میان و این برنامه رو تیش میکشن که یهودی های ایرانی از نظر خونی و نژادی با یهودی های اروپایی فرق دارن The case of Iranian Jugutis is nothing more than a typical Jewish attempt to conceal the truth تو فکر من واقعا مثل فیلم دیگه چجوری اینا با ناتسی ها مثلا روابط داشته چجوری باشون صحبت کرده چجوری باشون حاضر بشن به این کارا که کردن It seems unfair to apply the German regulations for Jews to these people Won't be here unless the person is a righteous. یک مرد جوان چلی یک سالی نازنین مسلمان ایرانی یاد خودش جلو می‌دهد برای نجات چند سال یا یک نفر. Hopefully one day. Yes, hopefully. In our Torah, it says when you do something big for someone, you make believe it's little. Someone does something little for you, you make believe it's big. زندگی اگه تونستی تغییر بدی زندگی یک نفر رو خیلی کار کرد. Impressive, Mati. I can't wait to see the whole film. Uh, Mati, what inspired you and what motivated you to initiate uh, this documentary? Uh, what was your incentives? Thank you for having me today. Uh, well, basically, it all began when uh, I met Scarlett Epson, who was a Holocaust survivor from Austria. Uh, she became to recollect her memory to me of how she could uh, manage to escape from Austria to England at the age of 15 with her mom. I was fascinated by her story and I started to make a documentary out of her story. Uh, hearing Scarlett's story encouraged me to educate myself about World War II and it was during my research where I realized about Abdul Hussein Sardari, who regardless of any religion or nationality, creatively saved many lives in Paris. I started digging into Sardari's personal and also professional life uh, that took me to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, where I realized that there is a list called Righteous Among the Nations that appreciate non-Jewish people who saved lives during the war. Surprisingly, I didn't see the name of Sardari in there, citing lack of sufficient evidence. So I decided to structure the narrative of the film by discovering any, document and, any documents and evidence related to what he had done to send it to Yad Vashem Halakas Museum in order to reconsider the case of him and giving him the title of Righteous Gentile. I got back from Washington DC to London and uh, with receiving a great support from uh, Iranian Jewish Center in London, uh, started to produce the documentary named Sardari's Enigma. And uh, about the inspiration, I can say the first thing that inspired me was Sardari's compassion and his kindness. I believe he greatly felt the pain of people at the time that he put himself in jeopardy to save people. 
And the other thing I can say is the, um, the audacity he had and his persistence and also his desire to make impossible possible, which he greatly did it. I would like to, later on, we would, uh, we would like to hear more about why his name is not uh, among the righteous among the nations. But before that, I'd like to know how Mr. Sardari managed to save lives in Paris and if he was just uh, saving Iranian Jews. Basically, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is the best part of his story of how he could manage and to control of the situation, to trick Germans to do his job. Uh, when German uh, occupied France, uh, the uh, Iranian embassy in Paris relocated to Vichy, the unoccupied zone. Sardari stayed in Paris to look after the building of Iranian embassy. At the time, Ibrahim Moradi, who was one of the Iranian Jewish in Paris and a good friend of Sardari, went to the embassy and asked Sardari for, for help. Back then, Iran's government asked Sardari for return. Uh, when Sardari sees people in need, so he didn't get back, he started, he stayed in Paris to help people. Uh, in the worst time, he chose a peaceful way to help people. He understood that race and blood are the two essential points for the Germans. So he creatively found a way by holding a lavish parties, many lavish parties at the Iranian embassy in Paris, and then invited uh, many high ranking German officials and made a very good connection with them. And then he began to start, began to write to Germans by using the concocted description of Jaguten, claiming that in Iran, we don't have any religion. Iranian Jewish, based on their race and blood, they are not Jewish. They follow the same customs, the same as Iranian. They celebrate no rules. And for that reason, we call them in Iran Jaguten, not Jewish. This claim of Sardari made up many, many arguments between uh, German officials. They just got back to him and saying that Sardari is lying and there is no such Jaguten. But uh, he continued his job and he didn't give up. And um, the other question you ask about the non-Iranian Jewish people, yes, we have uh, some, we can see some non-Iranian names in his list such as uh, Victoria Moradi, who was a British citizen, or Nakash family. Nakash family moved from Damascus to Paris before the war. Uh, when German occupied France, they just asked Sardari for help. Sardari issued some documents for them, claiming that they are Jaguten, they are not Jewish. And with those documents, they could stay in Paris safely. And uh, if just German knocked the door, they're just showing documents saying that we are Jaguten, we are not Jewish and they could be there, stay there safely. Let's turn to Alien and hear first-hand information. Uh, numerous movies and documentaries are produced focusing on Holocaust. We watched so many of these unbearable and horrific scenes, but you lived through them. How do you recall those days and how do you remember Sardari? I was only seven years old when the German occupied Paris. And I remember at that time, my father, mother, everybody around us, night and day, night and day, they, they started to have anxiety and fear. And uh, that, that we will hear all the time, the sirens, the bomb, the, the walking of the boots and terrifying time anyhow. So my, at that moment, my, Abi Moradi, who was a very good friend of Sardari, um, went to ask his help. And, Mr. and thanks to Mr. Sardari, he gave us illegal passport so we could, we could be saved and go, go to Iran. It took us actually one month to, got, to get to the border. But I wanted to tell you that at each border while in the train, in, in a, nowhere the train will stop. 
and the German officer, German, will come, open the compartment and ask for our passport. That was terrifying moments you know, that I will never forget and still have nightmare of it. I understand. I, I talk to so many survivors, watch many movies and documentaries and read uh, extensively on these subjects. Nevertheless, it's still extremely difficult to hear it again. Um, um, uh, Mati, in our conversation, you mentioned you have done extensive research producing this documentary and you found many interesting documents. Can you elaborate on that? The production of documentary took me to many archive centers around the US and Europe, where I found loads of authentic documents uh, about they happened and uh, also we took some interview with witnesses. Uh, there are many correspondences between Sardori and German officials regarding the case of Jakutin. One of the important documents that I can mention is the uh, Adolf Eichmann's reactor, reaction to the case of Jakutin. We know Adolf Eichmann was one of the major uh, organizer of the final solution. And uh, in his document, he mentioned that he got back to the history of Iran and uh, mentioned that the case of Iranian Jikutin is nothing more than a typical Jewish attempt to conceal and camouflage the truth. And there is no such Jikutin. All the Jews are the same and there is no exemption for the Iranian Jikutin. But Sardari did not give up. He put more efforts and continued his writing to Germans until eventually in 1943, when Eberhard von Taden from the Foreign Office, which is the other document, he actually uh, accepted the case of Jiguten and uh, mentioned in his document that Iranian of Jiguten who are currently, currently being treated by the German uh, authorities as Jews belong to the Islamic sect of uh, Jiguten. It seems unjustified to apply the German regulation for these people, and therefore they should be exempted from the German racial policy. There are many documents. The other one is the uh, French police report, which issued after the war in 1947, when they just monitored Sardari and mentioned that uh, Sardari stayed in Paris and helping people illegally. Yeah. Kovet, despite all his heroic action, he was charged by the Iranian government of the time for issuing passport during the World War II and later after the Islamic Revolution in 1979. All his belongings were confiscated by the Islamic government. As one of his family members, uh, what can you tell us about uh, his last years in, uh, la yes, in uh, you know, London and how he was coping with the situation? Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone who's uh, tuned in. And I particularly want to thank Mahdieh for uh, making this documentary. It's a stunning visual account of uh, my great uncle's life. And um, I hope you all get to see the, the film. Um, and I know she's working hard on, on getting it released. Uh, Mr. Sardari, in his final days, um, was alone. He was, I imagine he was afraid. Um, everything that happened in Iran with uh, the execution of his um, nephew, Amir Abbas um, kind of gave rise to his paranoia and um, his, in general, his state of mind, uh, depression and um, isolation. And uh, sadly, there was, uh, other than one cousin who lived in England at the time, uh, but our family, my parents were still in Iran. Uh, I was here in the States with my sister um, and he had no access to um, any kind of support from family or close friends. Uh, I imagine um, must have been just terrifying for him, uh, not thinking that he, he won't be able to come back to Iran or that um, he could be he, he could be chased or or uh, or found or uh... Yeah. Anyway. yeah thank you thank you for sharing i i also want to add i just i i got extremely emotional just watching that that first piece of madia's film because it brought back back so many memories not only visually 
Um, but because uh, when I met her first uh, years ago here in Washington, and she told me about the project, um, it took me back to trying to figure out who in the family could be helpful, uh, who still left, who would have memories of Mr. Sardori, um, and uh, who could tell the story and the facts. So, yeah, That's sad. We have to admit the turn of nature is not always just. <laughs> Uh, Elian, do you, did you or your family make any attempt to meet or contact Sardori after the war? Unfortunately, no. I didn't have the chance to meet him. But uh, a few years later, my husband, while he was in his office, he was introduced to Mr. Sardori. And uh, my husband did and thanked him and said that he had saved our life and all our family, as well as, as, the, as all my grandparents and everybody that, that had stayed, uh, stayed in France that had no problem, whatever. You know, he did. My husband could at least see him and thank him for all he has done for us. Matthew, let me go back to you. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, his name not in the righteous among the nations. Do you know why his name is not in the list? And do you have any update for us about uh, Yad Vashem? Basically, the first thing that they mentioned to me in 2016 was that they don't have enough document. So since 2016, by following the criteria of the Righteous Department, we submitted all the discovered documents and evidence to the Righteous Department in the Yad Vashem Halkas Museum. Uh, we believe that they have received enough documents and evidence, but the case is not accepted yet. For every time the Righteous Department said to us, uh, no, we ask for a reason. And they asked for more document. And we found the document and sent it to them. And then they said no. And then they asked, and we asked for a reason. And then they asked for more documents. It's almost four years we have been uh, in contact with the Yad Vashem and working on Sardar's case. The thing is, the Righteous Department asked for something that even is not listed in their criteria, or they asked for something that they have already received it by us. For example, on their latest uh, response, we have received from them, they asked the, the chairman of Righteous Department uh, mentioned on his response that the testimonies uh, given by the children of survivor who were born after the war uh, are insufficient. And then they asked for first-hand testimonies and also the testimonial forms to describe the connection between the survivor and the uh, rescuer. In response to them, we referred them to our previous submission. And we said that you have the original first-hand document. The first the first first-hand documents they have received is the original document that Sardari uh, issued for Muradi's family claiming that they are Jugutim, they are not Jewish, which is actual original document. The other thing is Elian Kohanim. Elian Kohanim was born before the war and she was seven years old. And she greatly remember the connection between his father, his uncle and Mr. Sardari. So this is firsthand and also this is the thing that they mentioned that the children should not be born after the war, but they have already received the proper interview with Elian Kohani. The other thing about the testimonial forms, uh, all the witnesses uh, sign and notarize and describe the connection between Sardari and uh, their family. Okay. All these submitted already to them. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I think uh, maybe they didn't go through to the documents properly, or maybe they want to make us tired. But the thing is, we won't give up. We are as persistent as Sardari was to, make, to save people. We strongly believe in Sardari's great job, and we believe that his name greatly deserves to be memorized in the list of righteous Gentiles. And uh, to update you, in the recent recent things that just recently a few months ago um, 
the chairman of Rochester department asked us for a new document, which is completely historical document. We greatly prepared and um, send it to them. Thanks to Hamid Sabi, Iraj al Farhan de Sambi, and all people who greatly in London supported this project. So we are now waiting for the result from them. I wish you success every time I visit one of Holocaust museums. Uh, I look for his name and ask them why his name is not there. So I really appreciate what you all are doing about that. Uh, Kabe, do you have any knowledge about any commemoration appreciation ceremony and the like in honor of Sardari's legacy or his magnificent deed in his lifetime or post-mortem? Uh, there were two, as far as I know, there were two um, appreciation ceremonies. Uh, there was one in Los Angeles uh, in, I think, 2004 uh, that uh, unfortunately I didn't get to go, but uh, uh, Mr. Feridun Hoveda, Amir Abbas's uh, brother, attended uh, and accepted um, a uh, commemoration for, to the family. Uh, there was uh, another event at the Holocaust Center in Long Island in New York, uh, where I actually have uh, here with me uh, the uh, Nassau County uh, um, gave us a citation uh, to the family on behalf of uh, Abdul Rasin Sardari. Uh, for all the deeds that, that, uh, that he's done. Um, those are the, the two events that I can think of in recent memory. We're hoping for more. He yeah. deserves much more and that we can have a ceremony for him, mm -hmm. honoring him. Um, Elian, as a direct survivor of Holocaust, witnessing the recent rise in anti-Semitism in the world, what is your message for us? We were all assured that we, this would never happen again. How highly it's disturbing to see the rise of anti-Semitism now so soon after. Unfortunately, we have to resign that as long as humanity, there will be intolerance, greed, discrimination, prejudice, but hope, tolerance, open-mindedness, love, justice and fairness, and it will prevail. I am a believer in the human spirit and goodness, decency and integrity. I believe we can overcome. Kaveh, let me ask you, as a direct descendant of personality who rescued life of hundreds of innocent civilians while harboring them to a safe haven, yet you don't, you, do you know and you observe the current situation in Iran and Islamic Republic denying Holocaust while propagating anti-Semitism? What is your thoughts? To me, it, personally, it's disturbing that anyone uh, at this time in history is able to, uh, it's unconscionable to be able to deny what has happened. Um, and, um, you know, what Sardari did uh, even for one person. Uh, I mean, there's documentation that he did for hundreds maybe of people. Um, even if you, if you do this for one person, that's reason enough to, to, um, to be celebrated uh, for your deeds. Um, and you know, what scares me is the current situation in the entire world, this rise of the far right, uh, you know, uh, this sort of return to fascism ideology, um, and all I can tell you is that I fully, full-heartedly share all of Mr. Sardari's, my great uncle's um, thoughts about tolerance and acceptance and, uh, you know, regardless of religion, regardless of your national identity. As a last question, Matthew, I, I would like uh, to ask you, many, including myself, are very excited to watch this documentary. When this documentary will be released? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I am the same as you. Uh, we had few screenings in London and one in uh, Georgetown University. We received a very good, luckily fortunate feedbacks from audiences. The thing is, it was uh, planned to have some screens in um, LA, Los Angeles, and New York, but due to this COVID-19, it's suspended. So, but uh, hopefully, very very soon coming out by. And right through film distributor. 
Thank you. We would love to hear more, but our time is limited. We are hoping to have a program soon uh, honoring uh, this great man. And Elian, Matthew, Kove, once again, thank you for accepting our invitation and talking to us. It is my pleasure now to turn it to Sabrina. For the second segment of our program, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Charles Kaufman. Mr. Kaufman has served Benet Brith for over 40 years, representing it around the world at the United Nations Human Rights Council and at UNESCO. In 1992, he initiated and promoted a petition that generated more than 10,000 signatures calling for the freedom of Syrian Jews under the rule of Hafez Assad. Eventually, through collaboration of Bene Brith and other groups, thousands of Syrian Jews were able to leave Syria. Presently, Mr. Kaufman serves as the president of Bene Brith International is a public relations consultant and media strategist, and is also faculty member at Texas State University. Welcome, Mr. Kaufman. It is uh, my great honor, <clears throat> first of all, to be with such distinguished panelists and, uh, and others today to discuss this most serious subject. It's a very broad topic with many dimensions, as we all know. Now, I don't have to tell this audience that anti-Semitism is rising in the, in the United States. If you didn't know it when you saw the graffiti, Free Palestine painted on the walls of a Fairfax synagogue, you know it now. If you didn't know it when Jewish students at UCLA or Stanford or UC Davis were challenged as student government candidates just because they were Jewish, you know it now. If you didn't know it when students on those or other California campuses voted in favor of boycott, divestment, and sanctions measures against Israel, you know it now. If you didn't know Jewish groups such as Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, and J Street work against Israel's security, you know now. And just this week at UCLA, a student government vice president resigned her position merely because her passion for Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people got her branded as a racist. The false narratives and blood libels that led to such anti-Semitism for millennia continue into the 21st century. These examples in California are being replicated in many states throughout the country on campuses where you find Students for Justice in Palestine, you will find anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic behavior. These issues used to get little attention because they gained little traction, but with social media rage baiting, it is an online sport 24 hours a day, anti-Semitism is, seven days a week. Social media, is driven by baiting others to engage. Now, provocative discussion is used to generate such engagement. Thus, these issues can become as incendiary, incendiary as the annual fires in the hills of California. Such hatred is difficult to control, but less to, but less to eradicate. Social media allows Louis Farrakhan and Iran Supreme Leader Khomeini to spew hatred toward Jews or the genocide of Israel and the Jewish people, but it still, but it restricts tweets by the President of the United States. So let's shift from college campuses to the COVID-19 pandemic for a moment. It did not take long <clears throat> just as it did not take long for Jew haters, just as they reacted with the Black Plague and the Spanish flu and so many other pandemics over time to blame Jews for being responsible for this pandemic. They blamed Jews, oddly enough, because they thought that the um, pandemic would give them an opportunity to come up with a solution an immunization uh, solution, and thus profit from it. Ah, yes, the profit motive. 
Theodore Herzl's aspirational vision for the Zionist movement is that it would quell anti-Semitism. Now, despite the challenges of the neighborhood, we know this, there is no safer place in the world for Jews than in Israel. Now, anti-Semites have weaponized words against Israel and Jews in communities, <clears throat> on college campuses, in parliaments, and now even in Congress. How amazing it is that a world of 12 to 15 million people, depending on how one counts, fascinates the world in such a nefarious way. We have lived millennia in a world of blood libels and false narratives. We read about the events of Pittsburgh, Poway, Paris, and so many places in Europe, Latin America, and Australia, and increasingly in America. Now, many of you from the Persian community may know about the pogrom of the Jewish quarter in Shiraz, Iran, on October 30th, 1910. Shiraz was a flashpoint, as many of you know, for other pogroms before 1910. This incident occurred following accusations that Jews had ritually killed a Muslim girl. As a result, 12 Jews were killed, 50 were injured, and 6,000 Jews of Shiraz were robbed of their possessions. And while today we heard about the inspiring, truly heroic work of Ambassador Sardari, clearly a righteous among the nations, the surge of anti-Semitism in the world is more than troubling. Maybe the blood libels and false narratives never left. The propaganda war rages online with a variety of content. Of course, Iran celebrates promoting Holocaust denial with a cartoon contest. One of the most famous winning cartoons showed a vintage cash register decorated with the famous facade of Birkenau, ringing up sales of six million. They, that key that locked, the key that locked that mechanism of the cash register bore the words B'nai B'rith. In a weird way, we wear that recognition as a badge of honor. In our media-saturated world, editorial illustrations are more and more common, most recently in Spain and Portugal. Anti-Semitic anti resolutions against Israel are filed at the UNESCO in Paris, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, while basic human rights abuses are virtually ignored against the world's most oppressive regimes. So what are the roots of anti-Semitism? For thousands of years, you know haters have sought our demise because they don't like our God, or we didn't accept their God or their idols. Today, haters continue their work because we have overcome their hatred. They are obsessed with that, and they hate that. We have achieved our way out of discrimination. New immigrants have worked, sacrificed, to give their children better lives. We have no apology for our successes. We make no apology for taking care of not only our own people, but for others, non-Jews, people who seek and deserve a better life. That's a, our Jewish value. In your community and many communities, we have been perhaps the most philanthropic ethnic group of people anywhere. Now this history is largely unknown to Americans, except to those who hate us. It is history that even not many next gen Jews understand either, as many young Jews come from assimilated homes. They know they are Jewish, but they don't know much about how Jewish happened. So is, is Israel above criticism? It is a free country, a democracy, a place where Jews are protected and open to criticism 
from both within and with and outside. So before I yield to Elham for questions, let me offer some ideas of how we might approach overcoming anti-Semitism. Now, if I could deliver a solution to this scourge, I suppose we know, uh, I, I suppose we would know because the Mashiach would come. We first must find the strength in ourselves and for our children and our grandchildren to understand Judaism, to love Judaism, to have pride in our universal wisdom and our accomplishments. We must educate ourselves about anti-Semitism and going back in time, this, we, we must realize and teach others that this is no modern phenomenon. Actually, in the past generation, we've made great strides in being accepted in our respective communities. We are accepted into social and athletic clubs and golf courses. We have busted through quotas at many fine universities. We have been elected to high offices in this country, and our entrepreneurs have flourished. Anti-Semitism didn't begin with the Holocaust. It didn't begin with the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal. It didn't begin with the pogroms before, then, and since then. It didn't begin in the Middle Ages, or what we call the Common Era, before then. Hatred of Hebrews goes back to being slaves in Egypt and even in patriarchal times. All told, more than 100 generations. We must educate our own Jews about our understanding in the beauty of God's amazing work. And we must educate others about the Jewish people and how we overcame everything in every generation to make the world better. Our message to the haters is this, take us or leave us, just don't persecute us. We are not the world's problem, we are part of the world's solution. And you don't have to become Jewish to accept us. We're not here to convert people, we don't proselytize. So let's work together as part of, the, of, of our, our, all of our concerns for humanitarian matters. All who wish to destroy us, and you know who they are, have to be willing to do one thing and one thing only. Accept us. Accept us, and we will leave in peace. And with that, I turn it back to Elham. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kaufman, uh, for your informative and valuable remarks and elaborating on two spectrums of anti-Semitism, both equally dangerous. In your remarks, you mentioned individuals like Louis Farahan and others who overtly spew anti-Semitic rem remarks against Jews and the others who demonstrate their hatred through the channel of anti-Israel, respectively, anti-Zionist rhetoric. As you know, uh, the majority of Iranian Jews were forced to leave their homeland due to, to this, due to discrimination caused by anti-Semitism. While appreciating the freedom of speech here, the hate speech on behalf of groups and individuals such as Farhan, who spread hatred for more than five decades against Jews while he's lauded by many prominent figures is hardly acceptable. How could this type of anti-Semitism utterance be constitutionally justifiable? And where is uh, the distinguishing border between free speech and hate speech? It's an excellent question. And it's a particularly troubling question because of the uh, saturation of, of social media, because there are many ways that uh, that, that people in the United States have a chance to express themselves freely. Well, let's begin with the First Amendment. Under the First Amendment, people have the right to free speech. And free speech can be defined in many ways, but, but free speech that incites violence and crimes that, trigger, that are triggered by hate, you know, they have consequences. Uh, you can't yell fire in a movie theater, so that standard inhibits, even restricts that behavior. 
uh, we are witnessing this issue on social media in a tsunami of posts intended to create rage. Uh, social media is coming under great scrutiny, and this is something we are trying to figure out. We don't have all the answers yet. Many states have hate crimes on the books, which increase the penalties if uh, hate speech accelerates to physical acts of violence that harm people. And then connecting those acts to the speech is what is necessary to meet that standard. So when hate goes viral, we simply can't create an immunization for it. I wish we could. The First Amendment, in fact, since only 1967, allowed flag burning as free speech. Now, just this past June, Germany and other countries have recently seen burning foreign flags as not only an expression, but as an act that incites violence. And clearly we see that here with uh, our social unrest going on in many cities in the country. Yeah, it's but they incite violence and destruction and they, they promote criminal activity. So as of June, they prohibit such actions. Yeah, it's irritating how a term of freedom of speech could be sometimes so widely defined. Um, historically, anti-Semitism has been simultaneously used by the ultra-right and ultra-left wings. What is the source of recent anti-Semitic movement in the United States and in all around the world? Well, this, this is really a strange phenomenon as we see anti-Semitism not only from the right, where we traditionally have, but now an even stronger dose of anti-Semitism from the left. What we're witnessing here is the perfect storm. So some, some organizations attribute such hate to far-right groups. And traditionally, that's where it has rested. But today, we find the same hateful rhetoric coming from the far left. So it's important to call out groups for, you know, from, on all sides you know, for this hatred. And in fact, isn't it strange that when it comes to anti-Semitism, the extremists on the left and the right who hate each other agree on one thing, and that is anti-Semitism. Isn't that strange? The third pillar of the perfect storm uh, are the extreme is Islamists, which is a more recent phenomenon in the United States. Now, certainly, when, when I refer to extreme Islamists, I'm not referring to all followers of Islam. Uh, but extremists, those who recruit and radicalize youth to join jihadists against the West, most notably in Israel and the United States, are the ones we are referring to. So again, it is the perfect storm. It, it comes from these three sources. Uh, that's very true. Mm. Politicizing religion was always an in, uh, instrument of destruction. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, that our history has shown that silence and being indifference repetitively cause harm and opens opportunities for discriminatory ideologies to be planted to the society. And what do you think uh, about why many of Jews among them celebrities choose to be silent? Well, that's a great question. And it is uh, something that has sprung up in the last, in, in recent weeks. So the way I view this is that just whether they're celebrities or not celebrities, some, some Jews are proud Jews and others are not. Now, the celebrities who speak up, they, they some obviously are, know a lot about their faith and then uh, and many don't. But, you know, the ones that are speaking up and whose names are appearing in the media, you know, maybe they know very little about their faith or feel no pride in the th things that make most Jews proud. Um, they know the stereotypes. They know the Jewish jokes. Uh, you know, maybe they can build some of these things in the themes of some of their movies. Uh, maybe they know the popular foods. May maybe they know a few Yiddish words. Uh, but with many exceptions, with many exceptions, 
This is what many young people, young Jews in, in the U.S. know today. Uh, with many exceptions, our Jewish communities come from assimilated families. And again, with many exceptions, they, many of them didn't go to Hebrew school, and maybe of them don't continue learning. They just don't, in fact, I would be willing to uh, bet that they can't even name the first prime minister of Israel. So I think their depth of knowledge on the modern state of Israel is a bit shallow. They just don't know. So it, it's, it boils down to ign ignorance. Now, what celebrities do know is that the media know they're Jewish, and so they ask questions about big, important issues to them. And they have no clue about the issues. They have no clue about uh, annexation. They have no clue about settlements. They have no clue about any number of, any number of things since the modern Jewish, since partition began in 1947. So they fall back on the prevailing politics in their own neighborhoods. Now, the general and the Jewish media had a field day with Seth Rogen's recent comments, uh, questioning the Jewish state's existence. Maybe you all uh, read about this. What he said is that he had been fed, quote, fed a huge amount of lies about Israel for my entire life. And for good measure, he said, I think religion is silly. That's fine, he's entitled to his opinion. But, but, but there are many people like Seth Rogen and his movies that are out there. So when he speaks up like this, it influences people. They bring very little knowledge about the Jewish people, the full history, um, modern day Israel. They bring very little knowledge about those subjects uh, in responding to questions about this. So they influence people, not because of the veracity in their statements, but because those statements are just shocking and support a popular political position, maybe by their peers. Now, why don't some celebrities speak up for Israel or Jews? Well, we'd have to ask them. But they maybe they just don't believe it. Perhaps they fear saying something that will hurt their, perhaps they fear that they will say something that will hurt their celebrity status. They have fans. They don't want to jeopardize their careers. And uh, let's face it, and maybe today's audience will appreciate this. They are not Esther from Purim. They don't speak up because they feel uncomfortable in their Judaism. That's my opinion. As you said, many are scared of labels, and nowadays it's very easy to label uh, others uh, with racism. I mean, while many grassroots organizations were established uh, after the Second World War, those sole purpose is to address and help eradicating anti-Semitism. As we can see with rising the current anti-Semitism, we are not where we hoped we could be in 2020. Where have we failed in this process and what more we could uh, do, you know, for this? The main area, I would say that the, our main failure is that we have not been unified, that we have not, uh, uh, you know, we, we, are a, um, uh, we are a free will people. And, um, you know, we like to joke that we, uh, you know, wherever there are, uh, Two Jews, we have three opinions, right? It's the old joke. So um, we, we have a variety of views on a variety of subjects. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, part of the answer lies in the fact that we're not united in working together as well as we could on many of these issues. So, you know, we, we and B'nai B'rith have been around since 1843. We, we confront anti-Semitism on all fronts. You know, I write letters apprising university presidents and others of, of what's going on on their campuses, what's coming up on their campuses. You know, we call out the perpetrators. We speak out at the UN, UNESCO, and the Human Rights Council. 
You know, we criticize the propaganda publicly. It, it, specifically, uh, one of the things that we did at, the, at UNESCO is that we advocated the end of UNESCO sponsorship of the Alst Festival in Belgium. Our public criticism of the propaganda exhibit promoting BDS at the Jewish Museum in Berlin led to a change in leadership at that institution. You know, we advocate for anti-BDS legislation in various states. We raise our voices and we were one of the few Jewish organizations in 1945 in San Francisco when the UN was established. And we remain a uh, non-governmental organization, an NGO. So we are in European countries to influence governments, to accept the definition of anti-Semitism, to put teeth in laws dealing with such hate. You know, we condemn, we condemn people, we express dismay and disappointment. Anyway, we have been doing this since 1843, and there are a lot of great organizations out there doing what we're doing as well. Um, we need to work more diligently uh, to speak as one voice. Uh, we are part of an organization of many of these organizations. It's called the Conference of Presidents. And uh, we do work closely on, on many, many things to educate ourselves to help fight anti-Semitism. Also, I did want to mention a couple of things that we, are, we specifically are doing. We are currently promoting a video competition for high school and college students to produce messages about anti-Semitism. So the, the deadline is September 15th and uh, the, the competition carries cash prizes. So if you in, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, uh, neighborhood of Hollywood and in fine, fil fine film schools know students who are aspiring to uh, become filmmakers and documentarians, we would invite them to enter into this competition. So anyway, and then for, for those here in the audience today, I mean, we, we invite full participation to support and get involved with, with our programs. Uh, Anti-Semitism is per perhaps the world's oldest epidemic. So with today's pandemic, people often say, we're in this together uh, with anti-Semitism. We have to fight this together. Uh, thank you so much for updating us and explaining about all these steps, especially education, since we all know that many of these uh, problems that we have is because of lack of education. And as you mentioned, many educational institutes and campuses are breathing grounds for anti-Semitism under the mask of Israel-Palestine conflict and are threatened and bullied. This extends to journalism and reporting, where most notably Barry Wise tendered her resignation in the face of harassment she received. Can you please share your thoughts with us? Yeah, on, uh, on the Barry Wise matter? Yes. Well, first of all, I remember as someone who is a uh, journalist and in daily newspapers for about 16 years, I can tell you that there, there was a time when uh, people's partisan views weren't that widely known, except in the editorial offices. And, um, and I believe theoretically there, there continues to be a separation between the newsroom and the editorial page office. At the same time, I think what is happening is that, and it may be a generational thing, I, I think that the journalists who are writing either for those opinion pages and maybe in the newsroom, they, they are more partisan than ever. Now in the editorial page, you're supposed to be partisan and you're supposed to offer a balance of, of opinions. Um, the, the word op-ed actually means opposite the editorial page. So it should be an a open forum to entertaining all kinds of uh, opinions about things, whether it's a letter to the editor or an op-ed. Now with the New York Times, the New York Times, <clears throat> um, well, this sophisticated uh, way of approaching opinion uh, used to take place at the New York Times. 
Obviously, there's a little bit of a departure uh, from, from that. They probably would disagree with that. But let me, uh, about Barry Weiss. Barry Weiss was like Esther. You know, she wasn't afraid to speak up. And, uh, you know, she was courageous in writing her resignation. Uh, she was authentic and not afraid of the truth. Uh, but, and, voice, and Weiss's voice will be missed at the New York Times. Now, so what's the New York Times doing about this? You know, they, they have said that they are looking into the charges, people accusing her of writing or making uh, critical comments about her, just writing more about, uh, uh, about Jewish issues or writing about Israel or promoting Israel. So there's been a, a great deal of antagonism. So, you know, look, I, I applaud her for her courage and her forthrightness. You know, she's a young journalist and um, uh, I am troubled as a, as a former journalist, I am troubled that journalism has declined in so many ways, uh, primarily just through straight reporting. Uh, but um, it's the world we live in and I think a lot of it is exacerbated through social media. That's sad. As our last question, what we as Iranian community in general can do to help? Ah. Well, what can you do to help? Well, uh, listen, like everyone, you, you are part of the family. You are part of the family. So we as, a, as one family can, should get more and more involved, uh, get more involved with B'nai B'rith, of course, join us join us in, in, these, uh, in the trips that we make to uh, the United Nations and its agencies um, and uh, work to educate students about anti-Semitism locally. And also I would encourage all of you to get in touch with uh, for all of the rabbis in, um, in, in the various branches of Judaism and, and talk about how we need to work together and, and teach, not only teach tikkun olam for the, for the entire world, but, but to, to repair the world as, as we go about repairing the Jewish community. So um, the more that, again, getting back to my comments about uh, being, being more Jewish, uh, that, that in, a, in a world of assimilated life, you know, we, 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 we've gone through a period where we want to blend in and, and that sort of thing. That's terrific. And we should assimilate to where, where we moved. Uh, but, you know, we do have to take great pride into who we are and be more Jewish, not less Jewish. Thank you. I'd like to add that anti-Semitism is not just Jewish problems. It starts with Jews as Holocaust started with Jews and many others from different ethnicity and from different background, you know, had... Uh, were killed be just because of the idea. Once again, thank you, Charles, for thank our you. invitation. We, we you, hope Robbie. all our audiences have enjoyed our webinar today and have benefited from it. Thank you.